the Rings, The Rings of Power, Season 2, Episode 7, Breakdown and Reaction. Episode 7, Doomed to Die. Plot lines appearing in this episode include Casa Doom, the army of orcs and elves on the battlefield, Aregion under siege, and Celebrimbor versus Anatar in the forge. There are no moments of Pelargir or Rune in this episode. So let's begin by discussing Casa Doom because it's the least entangled with the other storylines. The rest of the storylines all converge in this episode, so it's a little bit more difficult to discuss them separately. So that is why I thought we might as well start out with the dwarves. There's also a lot of incredible dialogue in this episode that I wanted to highlight, so hopefully this video won't be too long. There are several core Tolkienian themes at work in this episode as well, and I want to expand upon those and do some deep analysis later, because this video is more so meant to be an initial breakdown and reaction, so I think we'll have plenty of time for maybe some more in-depth analysis, especially since we have probably two years between seasons. We'll have plenty of time for that later. So let's start with Khazad Doom. In the beginning of this episode, Durin III learns that the elves of Eregion are now fully under siege. Rather than feeling the pull to assist them, however, the king insists that the dwarves must continue to delve even deeper. Durin IV and Disa hold the mine against King Durin for fear of whatever creature may lie beneath the stone and eventually the other miners join the prince in this effort. Elrond then arrives at the west gate, looking very, very handsome, to plead with Durin IV for the dwarven aid that he is going to need. Durin initially agrees to fight alongside the elves, and he rallies the dwarven armies, but he is forced to turn back when it becomes clear that the king has been driven completely mad by the ring after he turned his axe on his own men. In this moment between Durin IV and Elrond, Elrond says, A defeat without your aid. Thousands of lives are at hazard, Durin. Celebrimbor is among them. I know I asked too much of you, Durin, but I need your axe, old friend. I need it now. Adar's army marches upon Eregion. As the siege of Eregion continues, Adar's forces dam the river surrounding Austin Ethel in order to allow their army to march across on dry land. Elrond leads the cavalry charge alongside Gilgalad against the orcs, but halts upon seeing Galadriel held in a cage by Adar's army. This is another one of those things that this was actually leaked a long time ago. I think it was Fellowship of Fans leaked that Galadriel would be held in a cage and would have orcs poking at her with a stick. And I remember being super annoyed by it because... This show seems intent on manufacturing new ways for Galadriel to suffer. Seeing it actually in the context of the show, I feel kind of the same way. So Elrond enters the orc camp to negotiate with Adar. Here we learn a little bit more about Adar as he seems very familiar with Elrond's reputation, as well as the legacy of Meli and the Maya. There's also a funny moment where basically Adar is like, Dang, Elrond, you're, like, super beautiful. And then it's Elrond's responses to go kiss Galadriel. But we can talk about the kiss in a minute. So Adar presents this opportunity to Elrond, basically, to give him the ring, Nenya, in exchange for Galadriel's life. Adar says, it is an earnest offer. I suggest you take it and leave Sauron to me. Then Adar brings up Melian. He says, you have the beauty of your foremother, Melian of the Valar. If even a fragment of her wisdom is in your veins, you must know that you cannot defeat me in battle. I will outmaneuver you. My forces outfight yours, and you will fall. I also just want to mention if you hear like little squeaky noises in the background, that's my baby. She was born last week. Um, yeah, so everyone say hi to Clementine. She's sleeping, but she's making her little baby noises in the background. I also want to point out that Adar says Melian of the Valar. Melian is actually one of the Maiar, but I think this is probably done for two reasons. The word Maiar doesn't appear in the Lord of the Rings, so I don't think they have the rights to use that word. And then you could also say Melian is of the Valar because 
the Maiar are servants of the Valar. So that might be a point of contention for some Tolkien book fans, but it's not a super big deal to me. And I can kind of see why they might have needed to call her that. They also haven't really introduced the concept of Maiar, which can be a little bit confusing. So it seems like they've grouped the Maiar and Valar kind of into one category for the sake of simplifying the story. So then in this conversation, Elrond admonishes Adar and says that many of his children will die in the process of this entire war. And that draws Glug's attention. So I think they're really setting Glug up for some kind of action to be taken soon. Adar says, my children have endured cruelties that your bravest couldn't bear to hear spoken aloud. To which Elrond responds, are you prepared to spend their lives so freely, Adar? Are they? Elrond basically rejects Adar's terms. And then Adar is like, okay, that's fine. I'll meet you on the battlefield, but Galadriel is going to die. So then Elrond pulls a pin from his cloak, asking if he may be permitted to bid Galadriel farewell if she is going to die. It is now that we witness what is perhaps the most insane moment of this entire series because Elrond kind of uh, goes over and kisses Galadriel, his future mother-in-law. Before he kisses her, he says, forgive me, and she responds saying, win. This kiss caused a lot of problems um, within the fandom. I think the worst part of all is that I've seen a lot of people attacking each other for having different opinions on the kiss some hate it and some don't mind it some are actually feeling pretty favorably towards it and I think there's enough room for people to respectfully engage with this kind of expected choice within the show but what bothers me is when people start saying things like you're an idiot if you interpreted it this way, or I can't believe media literacy is completely dead because you interpreted this other way. Um, That is what bothers me. I really don't like to see the fans attacking each other. When I first found out about this whole kiss situation, it is something that I've had maybe a month to think about before I actually saw it in the episode because I think it was leaked on Reddit or something. And... So maybe my thoughts on it have had a little bit more time to cool off than others. So personally, at the end of the day, I do think it was kind of a weird choice, but I can also see why they did it or how they might explain it. So this is meant to be a strategic platonic kiss, as I've been promised, and it is really meant to distract the orcs from the fact that Elrond is slipping this brooch into Galadriel's hand so she'll be able to free herself afterwards. Much like Sauron's proposal to Galadriel on the raft was not meant to be romantic, apparently neither is this. So make of that what you will. I do want to point out that there are at least a dozen ways that this pin passage might have been executed without kissing, without kissing on the lips. Elrond looks really into the kiss. I think most difficult aspect of this kiss is the way that the camera zooms in on their faces and then the music swells in this moment. So I almost wonder if there's some kind of miscommunication between departments in terms of what this kiss was supposed to mean. Um, But at the end of the day, it's actually a really sweet scene. And the way that it's been explained is basically that like elvish love is so pure and different like elves express their love differently than we might in our world um and so if you think you're about to lose this person that you love so deeply you know you might do the same thing and honestly I can't blame him so it's a sweet scene at the end of the day I don't really care too much however I do think it's important to allow fans the time and the freedom to process this decision because it's definitely not going to go over well with everyone and I think being bothered by it is valid even after knowing what their intentions were with it. So at the end of the day it's moments like these that really affirm my position that the Rings of Power is indeed an original story set within Middle-earth which strives to communicate Tolkien's core themes while also forging a new path of its own. 
So last I checked, Elrond isn't kissing Galadriel in the books. There's no romance between them. There isn't meant to be one in the show, but I can see how some might interpret it that way. But the books are completely unscathed. And I would dearly hope that while we are discussing this kiss, people can remain civil and respectful of each other and allow each other to have the freedom of opinion and interpretation because that's a sign of a mature fandom and a lot of the times I don't see that in our discussions. And so now let's get back to the battle. Elrond is confident that the dwarves are on their way and he sends Vorahil to check in with them and then return to the battle. Meanwhile, Galadriel uses the pin that Elrond passed her to unlock her chains. Once she has escaped, Galadriel dresses up in an orc cloak to escape the orc camp. This was a cute moment because it reminded me of Frodo and Sam going through Mordor in their orc outfits. As she is walking through the orc camp, she witnesses a pyre for the fallen orcs, and Adar is doing some kind of a ritual type of thing for the fallen orcs. He seems very moved by the whole situation and grieved for their losses, and he sort of places his hand on their heads and he says, In flames they return to darkness. He seems genuinely moved by their deaths and grieved in the way that you would think a father would be. And I think it was very important for the audience to see this as well as for Galadriel to have this moment that really humanizes Adar and emphasizes what he feels he is fighting for. Galadriel is then discovered by a few orcs who note her pretty hair. Everyone is obsessed with Galadriel's hair in this show, which is very, very lore accurate. Um, but then she is rescued suddenly by Arondir. He initially insists on remaining in the camp to fight against Adar, who he holds responsible for the death of Bronwyn, but he is persuaded by Galadriel to take the secret passage into Eregion. This was a really great moment where Galadriel says, Come, I know a hidden way into the city. We must find Sauron. And then she's like, If you stay here and try to kill Adar, he will take your life. And then Arondir responds, he can have it. He has taken everything else from me. And you can see in this scene how he really has lost everything, um, how far he has come since season one. And it is, it's such a sad moment. So on the battlefield, Elrond is fighting against a whole bunch of orcs. His horse is killed by an orc, which enrages Elrond. And we can see this moment where he might be considering using the ring that he's carrying to heal the horse but then he ultimately decides to allow the horse to die. I think this is an important moment for Elrond because all throughout the season, he's been very against the rings. And I think as time goes on, obviously, if you've read The Lord of the Rings, Elrond is the bearer of one of the elven rings. So he has to get from point A to point B. And I think we're going to continue seeing that in this season. The battle then lasts well into the night. Rion, who is played by actress Selena Lowe, finally has her moment to shine in this scene. However, her character's death follows almost immediately after she does this really cool move where she has been shot by a whole bunch of arrows and then she pulls one arrow out and shoots it and, you know, some stuff explodes and it's this huge victory. It's sad because I was excited for her character. For them to kill her off almost immediately was a huge disappointment. Basically, she gets boromir but she is able to destroy one of the siege machines before her death. In the orc camp, Glug begs Adar to retreat, but Adar refuses and calls out Damrod instead. Glug views this as a betrayal because Damrod will kill indiscriminately, and he's not wrong. It's in these decisions that we can see that Adar is once again acting as a mirror for Galadriel because he's losing himself to his single-minded pursuit of Sauron, which is basically exactly where Galadriel was in the first season. Glug says, you told us you loved us. And Adar says, with all that is left of my heart, too much to let you become Sauron's slaves. So Adar is so afraid of Sauron and the fate that would befall his children were he to return, that he's willing to lead tons and tons of his children to their death. So when you kind of pull back and look at it analytically, you're like, who would make such a decision? But when you're in the midst of these moments that he's in, it's kind of like, I wouldn't say relatable because I've never been in this situation, but you can almost see how he would be making these decisions. So as dawn approaches, Adar himself marches with the orcs into a region. And as the sun rises, Elrond cries out 
And this is the worst. This is so sad. Elrond looks to the rising of the sun and he cries out that the dwarves have come to bring them aid. And instead, only one messenger arrives with news that Doran has recalled his army. This was such a good moment for Robert Arameo, who plays Elrond. And my heart like really broke at this moment for Elrond who seemed in shock for the rest of the battle. He has really been thrust into this situation where he's nowhere near prepared for it. And it just reminds me of our very first scene in season one with Alron, where he's like sitting in a tree writing a little speech. And I saw someone on Twitter saying, put that boy back in that tree. And it's almost like, I just wish we could go back. Elrond at this point in his life has already endured so much suffering, but it's honestly only going to get worse for our poor little guy. The remaining elves of Eregion prepare to stand against an army of orcs. Unfortunately, it appears that there are maybe less than 20 elves left to defend Eregion in total. Whether this was an intentional choice to display Eregion's unpreparedness for war, or just another example of the rings of power never hiring enough supporting actors for large-scale scenes remains to be seen. I would like to think it's the first reason because there are so many orc actors that have been hired and they're doing all of these practical effects. But then when you look at the elf army, I mean, I wouldn't even call it an army. It's like a little company. Now, I personally find battle scenes to be very, very boring, but I did love Gil-Galad's twirly, spinny fight moves. He looked really cool. I also want to take a moment to recognize the incredible supporting orc actors in this scene as well as just the whole battle, the whole series in general. I read that there were over a thousand of them in full prosthetics and makeup. From what I've heard, these are very uncomfortable and take a really long time to apply and remove. So I just want to thank anyone who might be watching this that played any kind of role as an orc in this season. You are incredible. So in this battle, there's also a moment where it seems unclear whether or not a Rondir is going to die. He's stabbed pretty hard by Adar, and is left lying in the mud, so I definitely hope that's resolved in the finale. For him to have a moment like that that results in his death, I think would be really sad and kind of anticlimactic, so I definitely do hope he's not dead. So ultimately, at the end of the episode, Eregion is completely overrun, and then we see Elrond bowing before Adar in what appears to be a surrender, but then he tries to stab Adar, who overpowers him and takes Nenya. Adar says, have you forgotten your rumil? Never make war in anger. So that was another really fun elvish reference. I feel like there's something about Adar that when he's around other elves, it's like a part of him yearns to return to who he was before he was tormented and turned into one of the Uruk. And so anytime he's around elves, it's like he just can't help but start speaking in elvish and start referencing elves. It's like, it's like his heart is calling out to them like, I'm one of you too. Like, we're not so different. The only difference between us is like how much torment I've endured. And gosh, I love Adar. So the final area of this story that we're going to discuss in this episode is, of course, my favorite, Anatar and Celebrimbor, but it's also the most painful to watch. Here we will begin all the way back with the opening scene of this episode and then the journey and then we can journey through the rest of this episode as it pertains to Eregion. The first 10 seconds of this episode are probably the dearest to my heart out of anything in this whole series because we see Celebrimbor drinking a cup of tea. And I'm going to be a little bit delusional and pretend that they added this into the episode specifically for me. So, you know, thanks guys. That was really nice of you. While this is a lovely moment though, we soon realize that this is in fact all a part of this vision that Anatar has crafted for Celebrimbor, and he's essentially trapped in this illusion. So outside on his balcony, he sees this pristine and idyllic Eregion. However, the spell is soon broken when Celebrimbor begins to notice small errors in the vision. First, the ruby in Feanor's hammer is missing, the candles are not burning down, and the mouse that scurries across the floor is doing so in a repeating pattern. This scene also featured Celebrimbor doing some actual forging, which felt like a real treat after so much of the forging of the rings has been done off screen. So at this point, the nine rings are nearly complete, and Anatar is like, it'll be a sad occasion when our time together is ended. 
And Anatar seems distraught over the thought that their time together might end soon. But I thought it was really funny that Celebrimbor seems to be feeling relief, actually. And in this scene, they're once again acting very domestically, which has been a really fun trait to see. Celebrimbor is think, probably thinking like, thank God this guy's going to get it out of my hair. And then Anatar can see that Celebrimbor is kind of having that sort of expression on his face. And then Anatar is like pretending like his feelings are really hurt. And the whole thing is just kind of funny. So Celebrimbor continues to work, but he's distracted by this mouse as it continues to scurry around in its special little pattern. Here we see him take this first step into breaking himself free from Sauron's illusion when he looks up at the candle in front of him and he places a mark on the candle as a way to track time. Now after he goes outside of the forge, Anatar is advising the soldiers to prepare for a ground assault because they realize that Adar's army has been damming the river that protects the city. By this point, Anatar has all but assumed command of the entire city after convincing all of the smiths and soldiers that Celebrimbor has gone completely crazy. In a chilling moment, Anatar tells Myrdania that she has proven her quality and will be duly rewarded. So I can't help but wonder what this could have meant and what his plans might have been for her had her fate not changed a few moments later. Returning to the forge, Celebrimbor has realized that he has been trapped within an illusion. And it is here when we begin one of the most painful scenes of the season. Anatar says, you sought peace, I gave it to you. Celebrimbor says, no, whatever this is, this is hardly a gift. What have you done to me? Here we see the brilliance in Charlie Vickers acting as Anatar, where his anger seems to be boiling under the surface as his face twitches in rage over Celebrimbor's accusation that he's not an emissary of the Valar. Anatar responds with one of the coolest lines from this episode, where he says, I am the one keeping the storm at bay, balancing the very sun above your head, all to give you this one chance to prove your worth. And then he's like, now I want the nine. Celebrimbor throws Feanor's hammer across the room towards Anatar, shattering a window which allows him to hear the sounds of the siege outside. With the window, the illusion is finally shattered. So Celebrimbor steps out onto the balcony and sees, for the first time in weeks, the reality of a region. Explosions, elves screaming and running, his realm is burning. Celebrimbor begins to sob, and it's here when I am having to seriously reconsider whether I actually want to watch this show because this is so sad, and I can't bear to see my poor sweet Brimby suffering so much. He returns into the forge to see the reality of his forge as well, so everything has already been partially destroyed. At this point, Celebrimbor is weeping, and Anatar is just cruelly standing by and watching. He then discovers that the mithril that he had been using to craft the rings was actually a mysterious black liquid, which is apparently Sauron's blood. And Anatar says, I have learned so much from you since I came to Aragion. But no lesson is more lasting than this. True creation requires sacrifice. Then Celebrimbor finally realizes who Anatar is. He is Sauron. Celebrimbor leaves the forge and enters out into the burning city, calling out for Myrdania. He attempts to explain everything to her, but she has already been so manipulated by Sauron that she doesn't believe him and just kind of looks at him like he's crazy. There's some dialogue in this moment that reminds me of this short story called The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. This short story tells the plight of a woman who has been diagnosed with postpartum hysteria and has been essentially imprisoned in this room by her physician husband, who treats her like an infant. The walls of this room are covered in this strangely sinister yellow wallpaper, which depicts a pattern that the narrator becomes obsessed with. She eventually comes to believe that there is a woman trapped inside of the wallpaper. Then she believes that there are many women, and then ultimately she believes that she is this woman who has been trapped in the wallpaper and has now become free as she begins to tear the wallpaper down. At the end of the story, Perkins Gilman writes, I've got out at last, said I, in spite of you and Jane, and I've pulled off most of the paper, so you can't put me back. Whether or not this was intentional at all, the similarities between the narrator's husband essentially placing her in this prison in which she is driven mad and Anatar's treatment of Celebrimbor felt really applicable to me 
when Celebrimbor says to Mardania, he planned all of this to force me to forge the rings. He put me in some kind of a prison, a prison of the mind, but I am out. I am out. You must believe me. Naturally, Mardania does not believe him because he sounds totally crazy. And Anatar manages to appear out of nowhere and take control of the situation. Appearing even more mad, Celebrimbor recommends that they cut Anatar open to prove that he is Sauron by revealing his black blood. Now, of course, this backfires when Anatar simply presents his hand, from which is now flowing red blood. Another illusion. Mardania is moved to tears by Celebrimbor's display of apparent insanity, and she tries to help Celebrimbor back to where he belongs. But as Celebrimbor argues with her against this action, Anatar subtly flicks his hand, which results in Merdania being thrown from the city walls by what appears to be Celebrimbor, and then she's killed by orcs. Anatar seems a little bit bothered by Merdania's death, despite being the one who caused it. It's always a sad day when you're forced to kill your new girlfriend who looks just like your ex-girlfriend Galadriel. He says to Celebrimbor, all this can end. Finish the nine and I will spare your city. Which is also interesting because Adar is the one commanding the army that's attacking the city. So I don't really think he has the power to spare the city at this point, but who knows. After this, Celebrimbor is forcibly returned to the forge and chained to his desk in order to finish the nine. Anatar continues to manipulate Celebrimbor in such an intense way that at times it almost feels a little too on the nose. It's almost like you could go down a checklist of 10 red flags to watch out for in an abusive relationship, and he's just ticking off each one as he goes. Anatar insists that it pains him to torment Celebrimbor, but that his hand was forced in doing so, and that Sauron is but the victim of, in all of this, and it's really Celebrimbor who's the, the author of his own torment. However, I loved this dialogue because Sauron begins to open up about his relationship with Morgoth. So Anatar says that Morgoth treated him terribly as well. He says, do you know what it is to be tortured at the hands of a god? We also get some very, very Sauron lines here where he says, I see the end, Celebrimbor, so clearly. I've seen it from the moment I awoke. But his end, Morgoth's end, it was different from mine. For what he wished to destroy, I wished to perfect. Sometimes the pain almost became a reward became a game, a contest to see whose will was the mightier. That's a really good line. And then, you know, blah, 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 manipulation, manipulation. And then Celebrimbor goes, you truly are the great deceiver. You can deceive even yourself. And of course, this makes Anatar mad. He's like, finish the rings. And then he storms off. This entire scene so perfectly captures the differences and similarities between Morgoth and Sauron, according to Tolkien, that I'm like giddy thinking about it. It's moments like this that the series really shines for me, and I can almost forget that 10 minutes ago Elrond was smooching Galadriel. Anatar leaves the forge once again, and so Celebrimbor throws all of the rings into the furnace, even though they can't be destroyed. I'm not sure if he pulls them out because he doesn't want to let go of them. It's, it's, it's kind of left open-ended why he pulls them back out. Is it because he sees that they can't be destroyed or because he can't bear for his creation to be destroyed? I think either one is valid. But so he pulls them out. He tries to use his forge tools to break himself free from his chains. I think it's implied that it's a very special chain because it's made perhaps by Sauron or you know some somehow enchanted by Sauron. So he can't free himself. However, then, ultimately, he uses one of his forge tools to slice off his own thumb in order to free himself. And he says, whose will is mightier? Like, ah, that was so good. Whoever wrote that line deserves a raise. After this, Celebrimbor comes into the courtyard outside of his forge, where the guards attempt to return him to his tower by order of Anatar, Lord of Eregion. By providential timing, though, Galadriel arrives and rests him from the guards. She's like, this is Lord Celebrimbor. This is the Lord of Eregion. And it's interesting that they're like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 you're right. It was very easy for her to solve the problem. 
In this moment, Celebrimbor and Galadriel have a moment in which they are both sort of reflecting on the ways that Sauron ensnared the both of them. Celebrimbor says, From the beginning, a part of me knew, a part of me saw, but I wanted what he offered, so I blinded myself to what he was. And Galadriel says, So did I. Galadriel urges Celebrimbor to escape through the tunnel, but Celebrimbor says he has to remain in the city that he himself built, and he insists that Galadriel should escape with the rings. This is such a sad moment, and gosh, I wish so bad if I could change one thing about this episode, if we could have had Celebrimbor and Galadriel kiss instead of Elrond and Galadriel. Like, can you imagine how wonderful that would have been? That would have been great. Sometimes I get so sad thinking about how I would have written this show, but I try to remember I'm just here for McPain's vision. This is their show, and I want to see the story they want to tell. If I want to go off and imagine different scenarios in my head, I can do that too. But at the end of the day, the show is what it is, so I'm just here for the ride. But it would have been really sweet. So she says, I won't let you face him alone. He says, I built the city. My place is here. I'm like, okay, according to Tolkien, I mean, Galadriel kind of built the city too but we won't think about that too much. Galadriel then apologizes for bringing Sauron here. Yeah, that was her fault. And she says, I'm sorry I wasn't strong enough. Then Celebrimbor says, neither of us is strong enough. There might not be anyone in Middle-earth who is. And I think that is such a good and important reminder because you do have a lot of the other elves who are being pretty judgmental of Galadriel, especially in this season, especially like Gil-Galad. But to have the full will of Sauron focused on you, like laser focused in the way that it was on Galadriel in season one and Celebrimbor in season two, there is no one who could stand a chance against that. And we see that in The Lord of the Rings, even with Frodo, how far he gets, and yet he still succumbs to the ring in the end because no one is able to stand up against him in this way, not through their own strength. I'm sorry I wasn't strong enough. No one is strong enough. The fact of the matter and kind of the whole moral, not moral, but the whole whole lesson of the story is that it's goodness that is enough. And in The Lord of the Rings, it's this, the will of Eru and the will of providence or fate or whatever you want to call it is strong enough. And so it's in this act of surrendering to providence, surrendering to fate, and just doing what you can, taking one step in front of the other, that is what ultimately defeats Sauron. So that moment right here, this was really, really special. And so Celebrimbor has this little speech where he says, perhaps the elves need only remember that it is not strength that overcomes darkness, but light. Armies may rise, hearts may fall, yet still light endures and is mightier than strength. For in its presence, all darkness must flee. And then Celebrimbor says to Galadriel and Amarie, and uh, it was so sad. So back in the tower, Anatar is furious over Celebrimbor's disappearance. The elven soldiers escort Celebrimbor back to his forge, where Celebrimbor is like, you're never going to touch another ring again, which I thought was cute because, you know, we know he's going to touch the one ring later. Ultimately, Sauron manipulates the soldiers into killing one another, and Celebrimbor is left to face Sauron all alone. Here is when we get that iconic line from the trailer where he goes, you think it was only you who put yourself in my power. And he says it in this very like mustache twirling train robber villain voice. And I love it. It's so funny to me. So Sauron's line here felt very key because it reminds me of the way that like a vampire in the traditional sense can't enter into your home uninvited or the same might be said for a demon. It suggests that you have to open yourself up to the designs of Sauron in order for him to quote unquote slither in as Adar phrased it. I think this might be a good line to hold on to and to hopefully discuss in more depth later on after the season has wrapped and we have more time. So, okay, episode seven, final thoughts. This is the best episode of the season, probably the whole series. I felt the same way after watching the fifth episode, but this one just like completely stole my heart. I'm about to take that image of Celebrimbor enjoying his cup of tea and I'm going to make it my whole personality. Like I'm never going to stop talking about that. I thought it was so cute. 
There was also just like banger after banger of dialogue here, which might explain why this video is so long. So sorry. I do think it's unfortunate that the Elrond Galadriel kiss is going to cause a lot of controversy. We've already seen that it has. People are fighting um, on Twitter about it. It's annoying. I'm sure like 800 stupid YouTube videos have been made about it. But I hope that it won't overshadow the rest of this really brilliant episode. So much good work has been done in this episode, especially by Robert Arameo, who plays Elrond. I also am kind of sick and tired of people asking him about the kiss in interviews when they need to be asking McPain about that. I don't think that Rob should have to be defending that. He's not the one who wrote it. Like, leave him alone, guys. If anyone needs to answer for the kiss, it's going to be J.D. and Patrick. We need to be asking them about it. I don't know. I don't like the whole idea of, like, when a character does something kind of controversial that might upset fans, they, like, throw the actors into the interviews to defend it when they're not the ones writing the show. They're the ones being paid to basically deliver the story that's been already written by the showrunners. So anyways, that's my tangent, I think. If McPain want to do some interviews about the kiss, I would love that. I'm also not sure if it's just because I've had like probably almost a month to get used to the idea of this non-romantic kiss, or maybe it's just because my baby was born last week and I haven't slept very much. I really am not bothered by it. it to me, it feels silly. I'm not going to throw a tantrum over it. Um, but I also do understand if people are bothered by it. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. There's also, to be honest, there's a lot of friends smooching in the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion. So if you're going to be bothered by Elrond and Galadriel kissing, but you're not going to be bothered by Turin and Beleg kissing, like to me, I imagine it's meant to be kind of on a similar level. People are kissing all the time. I think if there's one lesson that should be learned from this entire situation is that more friends should be kissing, not less. Also about Adar, all of these small breadcrumbs pointing to Adar's identity were so cool. I loved him mentioning Melian and Rumil and kind of talking to Elrond as if he knew him or like he knew of him. Um, and you just get this sense of Adar's elvishness, like crying out and and him wanting to be an elf, even though he also loves his children who are Uruk. His character is just so interesting. And it's crazy because him being an original character, he feels so much more Tolkien than a lot of other elements of the show. And so I've really enjoyed our time with Adar, and I hope we learn a little bit more about him. It's sad to say now that we only have one episode left before the long wait until season three. It's also really exciting, though, in a way, because I really enjoyed the between season period last time because it gave us a lot of time to sort of let the story settle. I really feel like The Rings of Power is a story that grows with you as you do rewatches and you sort of pick up new things that you didn't notice before and you have conversations with others that illuminate different things. You get to hear different interpretations. I really enjoy that. And I'm glad that the show does have room to breathe in between seasons because if we were like about to turn around and have to start doing promo for season three right now, I don't think I could handle it. Like this show kind of takes over my life when it is coming out because there's so much to cover, so much to talk about, so much to think about. So I personally, I'm very excited for a break. And I'm excited to just have the space to cook up all my crazy theories. I would love to hear your thoughts about this episode. How are you feeling about going into episode eight in just a couple of days? Leave a comment here or you can get in touch with me at Tea with Tolkien. Mm -hmm.